You're listening to Big World Network. Phineas Fracture and the Dolomites, Episode 7. Written by Joseph Gatch. Read by Michael Young. Abraham Lincoln, the last man to be elected President of the United States, and the first to be declared Emperor-elect of the United States, said to have gone mad after his wife was assassinated while at the theater. He lobbied that threats from within were as grave as the threats from without. With the rising tensions between the superpowers, and proof of espionage and sabotage of technological advances, Lincoln took the idea from Napoleon Bonaparte that the nation needed a stable, long-lasting leadership, and with Congress's support created an American empire. Already stretching through Mexico after the Mexico-American War, and later through parts of Canada, the empire kept its policy of not allowing invaders to keep any lands they attempted to claim if the empire had already conquered them. The same policy, already used by the English, created an ongoing race involving skirmishes between nations in order to gain some of the most strategic footholds around the world. The letter Phineas Fracture held in his hands was penned by the very same man who had started the paranoia which laid the foundations for the new American empire. Dr. Heisenberger, it read, I have reviewed the proposal for your monster soldier and have decided that your program would be of benefit to this great empire of ours. Funds and all necessary materials will be at your disposal. Proceed with the utmost haste. The wolves are at our door. Let us send them something more vicious. Sincerely, Abraham Lincoln. A monster soldier. Phineas dug through the desk until he found what he was looking for, the doctor's private journal. Scanning through it, he found the first entry regarding the monster soldier. I have set forth a proposal to the president. The man is mad enough that he might just approve of it. I have received word of his desire to create soldiers to set upon our enemies once war is declared, soldiers that would be unstoppable and who will strike fear into the very hearts of our enemies' people. My eugenics experiments would greatly benefit from the money involved, and the fool would provide me with the materials necessary. I have been selected and approved to proceed with my project. Little do they know, this is the beginning of their end. Work has begun in an underground facility. I have convinced the President, now Emperor, of the need of secrecy should the enemies of the state try to stop us. Workers have been assigned to me and they will build my new lair to my specifications. The complex is finished. The workers have concealed the entrance in the sewers and we may come and go in secrecy. Before they could leave, I threw them a party and the fools were rendered unconscious with a bit of tainted alcohol. Those who built my lair will become the first inhabitants as my slave army. No one will know where I am. Success. One month to transform an ordinary man into a controllable monstrous killing machine. The process, unfortunately, has rendered him unable to breathe normal air. A gaseous form of the chemical bath in which they are cultivated is required to survive. Environmental suits, like those of sea divers, must also cover their bodies at all times. They are slow, but magnificently strong. I have sent them out to garner more test subjects. Soon my army will grow, and all will be helpless to stop me. I will be emperor soon. The city is already cowering in terror, and I have yet to begin my conquest. I have been sending them out only at night to increase the fear in the populace. Incubation time has been reduced to 20 days. Some subjects have retained a fragment of intelligence. They have shown a level of thought that others do not possess. They should make excellent lieutenants for the rest. Phineas put down the journal, now sick to his stomach. This is all it was? A crazed man's goal to take over the Empire? For some reason, Phineas felt empty. All this time, wondering what was behind the abductions, the fear and the unknown, it was nothing more than a madman's political coup. He absorbed what he had read. Twenty days for incubation. That meant the Dolonites had been active for the better part of the month. But why, if their master had been dead all this time, would they continue their mission? 
unless continuing the mission was their prime goal until told otherwise, which meant that if they were not stopped, the entire city would be inhabited by Dolanites. There had to be a weakness. Obviously, their inability to function outside their environmental suits was their biggest flaw. However, as Phineas had witnessed, it was no easy task to breach. Once again, Phineas dug through the files, hoping beyond hope that there was something, anything, he could use to save the city. Abigail worked her way back through the field of containers and checked each one as she went. As she moved further down the line of subjects, the progress of transformation decreased, which meant that these were fresher captures than the ones near the entrance. She stopped suddenly and put her hand to her mouth to stifle a shout of surprise. Before her in one of the tubes was Marcus Weatherall, a mechanic she worked with at the airfield. He had gone missing seven days ago, and no one had heard or seen him since. It was assumed that he had quit his job and moved on as he is so often wished to do. She felt terrible that this was his fate. No one had even bothered to check on him. Like so many others down here, he probably wasn't even noticed enough to be counted as one of the missing. She looked at his face. It still bore some resemblance to the man she knew. Traces of humanity were still evident. His head suddenly picked up, sensing the motion outside the tube, but he looked Abigail straight in the eye. A feeling of sadness emanated from his gaze, as if he had given in to his fate. If there was any recognition in them that he knew her at all, he failed to show it. Slowly, his head dropped again and his eyes closed, going back into his hellish slumber. There was a noise off to Abigail's right, as she pressed against the base of the tube. Peering around, she inhaled sharply as a lumbering Dolanite walked past a few tubes down. Keeping low, she crept closer, until she saw more, most of them assisting as unconscious captives were stripped of their clothing and then hoisted into the tanks. One of the captives woke up as he was being put in the tank. One of the captives woke up as he was being put in and began screaming. He was quickly submerged, and after a few moments of thrashing, he settled and began to breathe the liquid within. His eyes rolled back in his head as he submitted to the changes that were about to take place. Cautiously, Abigail snuck further until she caught a glimpse of a familiar face. William was encased three tubes away from the one they had just put someone in. That meant that he hadn't been in there for long, and there was probably hope to still save him. She turned quickly and, in her haste, knocked over a loose cylinder that was standing next to one of the tubes. The clinging metal made the Dolanites turn. Abigail closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and muttered, Oh, crap! Listening to Big World Network.